everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's archive video, we have esteemed astrologer Erin Sullivan discussing transiting Saturn over the angles during a lifetime. As a reminder, we have a number of fantastic workshops coming up. We have the amazing Maurice Fernandez discussing the magic of the eclipses on November 4th. We have Cameron Allen doing his holistic embodied astrology series and Petra talking about the cross quarter days. If you'd like to learn more, we'll have the links below this video in the description, and you can also visit keplercollege.org. And we have viewers from all around the world, so if you can't make any of the live workshops or webinars, all of our classes and workshops are recorded, so you can view them at any time. And lastly, it is my job, actually it's my privilege to look through a treasure trove of archive footage and upload it to this channel. So for our students watching, certainly apply some of these techniques and philosophies and look at your own charts and those of your loved ones as you're studying. An example is Erin today talks about her first transit in Saturn over her midheaven and at 13 months old, she traveled with her father across the country. Now, it's funny because I pulled up my son's chart as many years ago, we moved from the Midwest and traveled 1500 miles in the car to the East Coast. So I pulled up his chart today and I looked at it and literally on the month of his transit in Saturn over his midheaven, we, we moved that month to the East Coast. So I, my, mo my mind is blown every day. And as I look through these old archive footage, uh, certainly look at the techniques and uh, the philosophies, because astrology blows my mind every day. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, let's get straight into the video. Oh, welcome everyone, thank you so much. It's very interesting that I have gone through more agony over doing this PowerPoint than any other, and somehow it has to do with the fact that I know too much about it. <laughs> and I, I, I'm still in the point, the, the position of discovery, you know, in astrology, and always, as we were just speaking, Eden and I, Eden and I, before you came on, that there's, you know, after all these years, I'm still having wow and aha moments. I mean, really, really important ones. You know, Saturn in Transit was my first book, and it was headhunted by um, Penguin Books, uh, and when Howard Sportis, dear departed. Um, was actually founding the Arcana Contemporary Astrology series, which when he got too ill to continue working and uh, eventually died, uh, I became the editor of the Contemporary Astrology series. So I actually published probably 30 or more of the best minds in our generation. And as well, you know, it seems like a bit of, what do they call it, when you're, um, you have self-investment. but. But I published through them as well. I, I, I was accepted by the, the actual editor of Arcana, not just by myself. And Saturn was my first book. And I thought, well, what a fine thing for Saturn is to teach me. And so I was extremely uh, rigorous about researching this because I'm the kind of person who doesn't want to just come off of some kind of thing that came off the top of my head and throw it out at people and not have any kind of groundwork. So my groundwork was massive. Primarily, as Enid said, it was Joseph Campbell who I, you know, really got this out of because it was mm, around 19, mid-1980s mid where I founded the Young Society in Victoria, British Columbia, and I was steeped in Young anyway. But also, I'd read Joseph Campbell, but The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which he wrote in 1940. Nine uh, in the, the hills of Woodstock and woods hiding out, you know, draft dodger. And he brought this book forth, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And, you know, he talks about the heroic journey in ways which are, he called the monomyth. Now, the monomyth is a word that's a neologism that was actually created by James Joyce in his book, oh, Ulysses. Okay, so it it's all takes place in a single day, and it really can sort of condenses the uh, the Odyssey of of Odysseus, Ulysses, into um, a single day, and so he actually used the word monomyth in it, and that and that's where Campbell got it from. 
and indeed, when working with Saturn, we're working with the hero with a thousand faces. And the one part about this, I'm mercilessly selling it up here. I don't normally do that. I am not, you know, um, very good at, at self-selling. However, when I do this, show you the talk, I'm only going to be able to show you the bare bones because the, the reports are actually more than 80 pages long and they're fair. They are personal. They're actually, you need your birth time, so we know exactly when. The first transition of Saturn is made. Now, I need to start this off. I'm going to go to the next slide. Maybe that's, no. I'm going to go to this, keep this one up for a minute. I want to explain, first of all, why it was Saturn and what what came up for it is and I think it had a lot to do with you know the fact that I was experiencing Saturn transit and that suddenly it dawned on me that there was a mythic cycle to the heroic journey and that it was there were four major stages in the Campbell material the call to adventure the descent into the unknown the atonement or the retrieval of the treasure which heroes are always after and the return where you are called forth to return to your community or your society or your home, you know, whether your adventure is literally around the world or whether it's taking place in your own mind, doesn't matter. Uh, it's about returning with the treasure and bringing it into society as something of value. When I look at this concept in, uh, you know, in a very practical way, it, it really is something that is, um, you know, to, to review your entire heroic journey because clients have actually done it. When I'm always impressed with that, as I said, where they go through it and they don't realize what they've done <clears throat> until I tell them, well, look, here, you know, you can get this. And what it's really good for is that it will help you connect with formative events as they occurred in time, Kronos, with the Saturn transit, which is our both infrastructure, our bone structure, and also our echo structure, that which is exostructure, which is our, our skin. So Saturn really holds us up and in, <clears throat> and it times, uh, times our lives, times what we go through. And Depending upon where Saturn was when you were born, the first angle, let's say we're born with it in the sixth house, and it crosses when you're 19 months old and the descendant. Well, that would mean that you are a person who is constantly and will repeatedly throughout your entire life always be you know, working towards bringing some kind of boon to humanity. You know, be it great or small, it, it, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and so I was born, in fact, with Saturn about, let me see, uh, 20, 10 degrees from my midheaven. And so my first call to adventure was Saturn to the MC. And that would have associated itself, interestingly, I'm not going to go on about myself throughout the whole talk, but interestingly, my father... Uh, had just finished, it was after the war, just after the war, he had just finished his pre-medical in Vancouver, British Columbia, and he was, we drove when I was 18 months old out to London, Ontario, so he could take his uh, medical, uh, his MD, out in Waterloo, in uh, in London, England, or London, Ontario. So I actually, as Saturn was crossing my midheaven, I was on the road. <laughs> and I've been on the road since the day I was born, and I have been always searching for the adventure. And that is the Saturn transit in my ninth house, crossing my midheaven <clears throat> at 18 months old, and then again 29 years later, and again another 29 years later. Some people can get three. Typically it's two, two and a half cycles of Saturn around the chart, but, um, you know, people are lo living longer, and people like Joseph Campbell himself, who died precisely at his 85th birthday, right, as his Uranus return, occurring also with the Saturn transit, um, 
had lived a full individuated life and the Uranus return, you know, is symbolic of, of you know, the, the end of individuation, of becoming increasingly more of who you are. People do live to be 90 and 100, but um, they don't have the same, same quality of, I need to do more, I need to get better, I need to do, you know, individuate. I, they're usually, I am who I am at that one, sort of like, like Popeye saying, I am who I am, Popeye the sailor man. Now, what uh, precipitates and what is it about this business of Saturn? Uh, I think I'm going to quote from Eric Neumann, and he wrote about here, thus the hero is the archetypal forerunner of mankind in general. His fate, this is remember times past, his or her fate is the pattern in accordance with which masses of humanity must live and always have lived, however haltingly and distantly, and however short of the ideal man or woman that they have fallen. The stages of the hero myth have become constituent elements in the personal development of every individual. I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. Also, too, contained in the monomyth, because that's what your hero journey is about. Uh, well, when you read your own, you will be, you know, fall apart. It's really great. But it does say, like Carl Jung said, if you can put yourself in the mind of the primitive, you will at once understand why this is so. He lives in such a participation mystique with his world, as Levi Brule calls it, that there is nothing like the absolute distinction between subject and object which exists in our mind. What happens outside also happens, happens in him, and what happens in him also happens outside. Now these are um, going back into periods of time in the development of, of human beings where there was such a thing called participation mystique, which is, you know, a very elegant French uh, terminology for being at one with your environment. Uh, there is no bush other. There is you and the bush. There is no animal other. It's you and the animal. And if you're needing the animal for food, then you participate in a mystical way with the animal and it becomes part of you. So there's an ultimate respect for the invisible, for the nature. And so we have this in ourselves. And, you know, I really intended for the hero journey to become for people and a kind of baseline for uh, a kind of personal psychoanalysis so that you have a chance to actually just flip through a page and go, oh my God, this is what was going on then. Oh, I see. Read it, understand it, you know, work on it. And so there are four phases that are connected with the crossing of Saturn over every angle. Uh, now, why angles? Well, for obvious reasons, because they are the only real points of horizon and meridian, or meridian and ascent, um, horizon that are actually real. And now I can hear everybody uproaring about houses, systems, and so on. I'm, I'm very, I, I use house systems, I believe, in them totally. It's just that really, in fact, it, there is only in a horizon and a meridian. And so whenever those angles, you know, if, you, if you have planets on your angle when you were born, on any of your angles, you know very well that it's a powerful influence in your life. And when you have a transit of a planet over an angle, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto particularly, there's a profound adjustment and intake that takes place where you become in participation mystique with your own reality. And it, it is a really good way of looking at, at yourself and saying, and, and without hurting yourself, that's the beauty of what I, how I write is, is that you don't have to look at yourself and go, oh, I'm such a drag, I'm terrible, I'm, you know, I'm this, that, and the other. It, it puts you into a space of really understanding how your psyche is playing into 
your ego, your I amness. And there are always certain times in our transitions through life where we do become egoless. In other words, our, it gets very weak and soft, and it, it's not very well contained. So that the deep inner self can actually poke a hole in it and externalize something new from the, within. And this is not an uh, an original thought. I mean, you know, there's the acorn and the oak tree thought, which is just exactly what I've said, that within yourself there's increasingly amounts of you <laughs> that have yet to emerge. And so to be able to look back and forward and to see how did I solidify, contain, you know, feel sort of burdened, if you will, by life, and undergo this sort of macrocosmic cycle of eternal return. And so these these cycles that I've got outlined here, the first thing that I would mention is step one, when Saturn goes over an angle. Step one, separation from the known path, either through a perceptual shift or an event that thrusts you out of your regular routine. The next stage of a transit of, say, Saturn over any angle is it's, there's a period of ego loss or identity crisis uh, during which there's kind of a chaos of polarities and opposites that occur. And in this uh, process, in alchemy, it's called a massa confusa. <laughs> Then they seem suspended in liminality. You literally are liminal. You are living in the threshold. You are you have not yet exited, okay, say one room, nor have you entered the next room. So from this sacred transitional space, on this very real relationship of angles, um emerge many images of what could be possible. And then in the final stage, well, there's never any final stage to anything really, but in number four, finally, a storing period, sorting period comes in, where, which from the possible options, actual alternatives emerge that may then be chosen and incorporated into your life. And the, the, the turbulence of polarities begin to realign into a more focused new direction. And, you know, I don't even have to be talking about Saturn or your personal hero art journey. Those four stages, are, they happen to us all the time. I mean, they might happen to us when we first wake up, and then we get decide that we will stay awake, and then we decide that we will get up, and then we'll just, you know, it, sometimes it's, you know, getting out of bed. You know, in the morning is a major heroic journey. And in order for us to really use these uh, powerful uh, turning points, we do need Saturn, because Saturn actually does lower the threshold between our conscious hold over the environment and our unconscious mind. And it brings about the necessity for unconscious material to surface, so that the lowering of the threshold as it will happen in the stages, actually allow us to experience something that can appear as a symptomatic depression, not a chronic clinical depression, but just a depression of the senses, which is which actually is a creative emphasis. I mean, from the origins of, of, of thought in of psychological thought, which really go back to the ancient Greeks, they really did, they were the first, I have to say, the tragedians, they were, or, you know, so sort of the beginning of Western civilization, which is beginning to turn out not to be <clears throat> such a great idea. Um, we are now at a place where we really, ourselves, individually, will have to become exceptionally conscious in order for us to enjoy our lives <laughs> and love people and ourselves. And so when Saturn lowers the threshold between the conscious hold over our environment 
and our unconscious mind because we keep it to a dull where we really don't want to know everything that's under there. If you did, you'd, you would go mad. So it brings the, about the necessity for unconscious material to surface in degrees, okay? Like, for example, here, <clears throat> Saturn crosses the midheaven. And in the 10th house, it's a culmination of aspirations. At every threshold, you'll notice I've got struggle, 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 struggle. Well, I'm a fond, <clears throat> obviously I, I'm somewhat trained in Jungian ideas, <clears throat> and I really liked him. Anyway, from the very beginning, when I first picked up my first book, um, the story of Joe, because I identified with it as an, a sort of somewhat suicidal teenager, as people with um, Sun Square Mars, Saturn, Pluto might experience. But I also um, found that that uh, you know I found a great deal of solace in in all these these amazing, lovely words. But then I like words, as you can tell by my writing, and it, it you know and and I was gotten to be very tired. Um, that Saturn was you know, always seemed to be very serious and dry and, you know, I don't know, the, the, it didn't have quite the fullness of interpretation. And then I started to be, realize that there was so much more to it and that it had a lot to do of undergoing an almost, you know, heroic entering into the wasteland and during times of challenge and testing and there are distinct time periods that are critical for action. There can't be one person listening to this who has not undergone something that they probably would not just tell their next door neighbor. I have just experienced an, the most numinous encounter with my unconscious having brought me to the front of the room where I need now to pay attention. I mean, you, they're probably they'd say, well, that's very nice and press on. So the lessons learned from Saturn can be very serious and dry. However, I'm not necessarily divining a cut and dried model because those such things are the death of spontaneity. And the beauty of myth is it doesn't conform to models. In fact, it dissolves models. It, it destroys a modular shape. If we live in a mythic world, then we're living in a world of constant motion, constant liminality, constant thresholding, constant struggle, struggle, struggle. You know, it was, even Mercy Iliad was the one that put, you know, words to saying, you know, if it wasn't right, here's a quote. Mercy Iliad says in Sacred and the Profane, he's a, a fantastic uh, author, by the way, acting as a fully responsible human being, Man imitates the paradigmatic gestures of the gods, repeats their actions, whether in the case of a simple physiological function such as eating, or of a social, economic, cultural, military, or other activity. I think you understand that now. And that this was the, the impetus under which I wrote this report I mean, I'd love to just sort of go on and on philosophically, but I I think it's important for me to really start looking at this practically. And some of you will probably already have made notes on the times when Saturn first crossed an angle in your chart. Okay, so now I'm about to tell you that your heroic journey doesn't begin at the midheaven unless you have Saturn in your ninth house. And it doesn't happen if it's in 10th or 11th or 12th. The, your call to adventure will occur at an age depending upon where Saturn was in your natal chart. So if you had, say, Saturn in the fourth house natally, if you have Saturn in your fourth house natally, there's a whole the story around what that means about having responsibility for retrieving roots and, you know, when the hero gets there, he has to seize the treasure or the maiden or the grail and flee. But Saturn in the fourth would indicate that you, the first crossing 
of an angle, you would be almost like, let's say it was really close to the IC. Saturn was uh, maybe 15, 10, 15 degree, degrees from the IC. It could be seven years before you really responded to your call to adventure. The whole thing is called the call to adventure. And so you would then be named, if you will, the person who brings the treasure or the boon to humanity, to mankind. That sounds very grand, yeah? I mean, not everybody is, is Theseus bringing democracy to Athens, but your whole threshold struggle will be between being invisible, in other words, just a little worker bee, or really bringing yourself out into the, the world of other people and and actually finding, you know, that your heroic journey is about a constant seeking of understanding relating relationships. And that can be in almost any zone that, that we have, right? Because you're going to do it differently than I. Mine happens to be being born, the, the you know, actual call to adventure, where, you know, I have to sort of leap over and go and seek out all sorts of dragons and demons and interesting things and people and worlds and so on. And, you know, that's that's the story. Let's say you were born with Saturn in your first or your second or your third house. Then your heroic journey would be called atonement, the retrieval of the treasure. In kind of everyday words, what that does mean is, is that there's something about when you know, let's say you were 18 months old or six years old at any age. It starts your heroic journey. It does not begin until Saturn crosses the first angle in your chart, which sets your pattern for life. And that's where it gets really interesting. Because it's quite surprising how, for instance, I was as a baby, 18 months old, father goes to medical school. Um, I become entranced by microscopes and all sorts of stuff, and science. I, I mean, what, you know, aside from having genetical stuff, why would I have that absolute, utter determination to culminate in some form of aspiration towards a place of social sophistication? And also, I had to go through a tremendous amount of real real research, like hardcore research to get this. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I got an incredible amount of data, uh, you know, from people by just studying them, a great big long list. And this was 1989, 1988 and 89, sending them a long list of dates, what happened and what influenced your life on these dates. And I just, and then they could put it into their into their typewriter, which is what we were using was Selectric. So those days, computers were still not as sophisticated as they were now, um, even though I had one. I'd, anyway, and they would then write the answers. And I was like floored every time I read that every time that Saturn went over their you know, angle, that they would behave in a particular way. And it would be really in sync with the archetype of the of what's going on. So it, again, like I say, it, it really depends. Your the beginning, your origin of your journey depends on when Saturn and where it was when you were uh, born. And so that if your Saturn was in the first quadrant here, you might say to me, well, why why does it start at the midheaven when the ascendant is birth? Well, listen, I agonized over that so long and so much, and I finally came to realize that it has that that it had nothing to do with it, and that it really had to do with you know the adventure of of entering into the world of the of the of the known, and as Marie Louise von Franz says, at every struggle, at every crossroads, um, there is a struggle where. Uh, whether it's the infant struggling for food or the human elder struggling for life, but at every meeting of the crossroads, we will automatically struggle, especially in the cadent houses, 12th, 3rd, 
sixth, and ninth, because those are the ones that are prior to, I've got to cross this. You know, if you have some like little sort of person all scared and nervous opening the door and saying, oh my goodness, it's raining, I can't go outside, I'm just going to go back in and watch TV. Okay, maybe I could just get an umbrella or find a way to get into this 10th house instead of struggling away and, you know, and finally the step forward, and all of you have been through this, you know the relief, the sense of relief, like you didn't get poisoned, nobody died, you know. I mean, sometimes people do, but I don't mean it that way. Um, and where we are indeed part of our own journey, and you take responsibility. And so if you're born with Saturn in the first quadrant, and it's heading toward the IC, then it's, it's, it's a sector of the horoscope that's known as self-development, right? I'm going to go back up here. Okay, Saturn in the 10th house is where we go through social sophistication. So that when Saturn is transiting your midheaven into the 10th house, you're expected in some way by probably yourself and society to, you know, live up to your uh, aspirations and your potentials, even if you're in grade one. You know, when you get your report card, says is not living up to his or her potential. That was me. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't know what my potential was, but <clears throat> I seem to have passed, <laughs> finally. And so, you know, it's like we need to, you're, you're already born in a state of high-level excitement, okay, if you've got Saturn in the 10th house. Saturn in the 10th is power. It truly is in, in, a, in a very positive way in the sense that he granted the mythic Kronos um, castrated his father and was the midwife of Aphrodite and, and, and the Furies and then, you know, punished and sent off to, you know, um, a place, a very special place in Hades for him to hang out. But then he became, you know, a kinder god. Someone gave him, a, a you know, a kind of promotion. and. And he became one of the founders of Rome. So he became a lot more agricultural than, than scything and, and castrating. And so Saturn in the first house, in the tenth house, you have a pretty heavy burden there to carry because there's always this sense like, oh boy, I really have to, you know, live up to whatever my parents handed me and and you know do this and get it, you know, working. And if we move Saturn into the eleventh house. It's still in this area of, of social sophistication. And again, I'm not citing ages, okay? I'm just saying this is where Saturn was where you were when you were born, if you were born with Saturn in the 11th. It has to do with a really deep no, uh, need to find a, a, a tribe. I mean, it is the highest house of tribalism. It used to be... Um, you ruled by Saturn, yeah, in the old old terms, before Uranus came in and, you know, crashed his way into the 11th house and said, sorry, move over, back to your proper house. And and so, you know, in our terminology today, um, we're talking about tribalism in the 21st century. And that's a very different story than tribalism back in the uh, sort of um, Neolithic days. But on some level, nothing's changed. And it has to do with the needing of people of like mind. And so Saturn in the 10th has every possibility of becoming a very important person within a tribal situation. The underbelly of it is becoming very shy. Either one is fine. I mean, I, I've never been... A, one to find fault with any aspect or planet. I, I always try and, and see, well, how is it best best worked? If we go into the next phase of Saturn in the social sophistication house or sector, what we have is Saturn in the realm of the soul. Now, I... I mean, a lot of us, maybe when we started out, I don't know how old all of you are, but, you know, I'm pushing 70 next November, 
And, um, you know, society has changed a tremendous amount. I've been involved in loads of social activity and so on. But the realm of the soul has never changed. I mean, that is that is what it is. It is the soul. It doesn't have to do with the body, except as uh, the balancing out of Pisces, Virgo axis is, you know, uh, psyche, soul, and soma, body. So we end up with a, you know, psychosomatic condition situation going on here. But, you know, as it says here, embodiment of the treasure, this is where you're, you go through a period of time with Saturn anyway in your 12th house. But if you're born with it there, you're born with this um, longing to return, if you will, to some really important spiritual place. And that your relationship with your body, because it's in opposition, it might be a problem in that you, you don't really like being in the body. And so that you maybe find that you have to do a lot of spiritual work because that's really important to you. And so the whole social sophistication transit of Saturn, well, that would, you know, if, if you were born at the equator at noon, then these, it would be a perfect square. But, you know, it's not usual. Maybe you'll have, a, you know, sort of a 75 degrees in your, this sector here and your that quadrant and then another 75 in the other quadrant and a majority in the other quadrant. So we just think in terms of Saturn in the 12th. Well, it means I really need to struggle because the first angle that it will transit when you're born, after you're born, sorry, is the the descent, the quest for identity. So you will find yourself in times of your life that there is a theme that has to do with seeking identity and undergoing self-development. So this the descent of Saturn across the ascendant is about rediscovering the self because remember I talked quoted something about loss of ego it's very important to let go of ego so that self can be born and in, ego has got a bad name yeah uh, a lot of people have given it a really bad name because basically all it means in Latin is ego like ego sum I am okay well that's not a very you know, shocking or, <clears throat> you know, self-centered way of thinking. Well, it is actually very self-centered, as it should be. I mean, that's what the center of a horoscope is. That's you. This is you right here, self-centered, right? So if you're self-centered, you're in the realm of the soul. But you're always going to struggle because you're in a body, too. So you have to struggle and get across the ascendant. So people who are born with Saturn in the first house, have a real need to really find a strong sense of identity. Like, who am I? And when Saturn transits that house, same, you know, think in terms of both, you know, uh, your own transit and the transit, per uh, you know, period. That when Saturn goes through the first house, there always is a high level question of identity because there's been a loss of ego and identity in the 12th house and then it enters the crosses the threshold and there's a big struggle as Marie Louise von Franz says every hero reaching the uh, threshold of another reality will undergo a tremendous struggle and will either you know succumb to the anxiety or will in fact rise and greet the uh, the new relationship and it's a relationship of yourself and so there's a re and again depending upon the age and this is where you know I can't go there because you know we don't have time but at least I'm giving you the, the kind of outline and theory of how this works while Saturn is transiting our entire the recovery of and rediscovery and redistribution of yourself your actual who you are your ego identity it, now it's about incorporating your resources. Now resources can be anything from being alive to owning a house to having lots of money to having no money to uh, 
you know, having an incredibly deep creative core. So it's time when, after we've gone through this whole, you know, process, that once we, re we say, okay, I, I kind of got who I am. Yeah, I'm much stronger now. And now I'm going to start to really make use of my resources. Now, resources for human beings are time, love, money, energy, and focus. And those are our primary resources. And this is where it becomes very important in self-development to find what resources are truly your own, that are yours. Or even you could borrow, because we always have to think in terms of astrology as an oppositional situation, because it always has the polarity to it. So the whole concept of incorporating resources also involves you know, undergoing a relationship with, with a very mysterious entity, you know, like a corporation or a marriage or resources being merged. Born with Saturn in the third house means that, <clears throat> and in fact, by the way, the whole, if you're born with Saturn between the first house, the angle, ascendant, and like two minutes, you know, on the cusp of the fourth house cusp, you are in the, you know, for life. <clears throat> Your whole life is focused on becoming a better person, <clears throat> on developing yourself and be using yourself as your best resource. And, you know, if you're born, and, and in specific, you know, the first one is, you know, really finding an identity and the second stage of self-development is incorporating your resources and and the third stage of the of the self development phase is assembling the tools now what tools okay in you know easy you know in beginner astrology we learn that the third house is early education right it's like um, primary school and it's where we gain our our first um we learn how to read we learn how to do maths we learn how to do drawings we know how to keep Eventually, we learn how to stick within the lines. Eventually, we become rather skilled at it. So we, we're talking about assembling tools in a very psychological way as well, like tools for thinking, tools for assembling, tools for working, tools to take us across the next crossover. And so people born in the self-development period their first Saturn transit over an angle will occur at the IC. So they are, in fact, the atonement and retrieval of the treasure phase person. And that means that there is a secret heroic side to the life of the person born with Saturn in the first quadrant and what it is about uh, is that it has a, a great deal to do with, uh, you know, your earliest, most foundational phases of your childhood that, and how they involved your identity. And, I mean, when you have Saturn in your first quarter in any of the houses, there, there tends to be a, a reasonable sense of independence or, or actual fear of being overly integrated into groups and organizations. I mean... And sometimes it's actually not particularly family orientated, like towards your own family. But when when that person like reach, achieves their say f their first Saturn return at 29 and a half, it's that's very important. The second when the Saturn actually returns at its at 29 and a half, because that's the first stage of adulthood. Um, it it emerges, you know, this business of in the first quadrant, make your own life. It emerges as a really powerful theme, and the and the nucleus of which lies the concept of family and legacy and roots and origins and and uh, all of the things that have to do with family and security and home, because that's where you cross over. That's where your threshold struggle is, and so the date that that occurs would would mark clearly. Uh, a time of going into the area that's called 
excuse me, I have to call. That's called Atonement Creative or Retrieval of the Treasure. I'll explain that. Creative development. Well, that just it doesn't mean that you know if you're born with your Saturn in the first house, you can spend your entire life atoning for everybody else. But it really has to do with like being aware that um, that that you may be a hero who actually does have to, you know, look after other people and to make sure that you are really paying attention to them. In the second quadrant, where it's heading up towards the ascendant, descendant, sorry, means that, that you're actually, you know, of the heroic birth, wherein you will constantly be, you know, looking to bring something really important to the world, you know, be that a calculation or, or a, a beautiful design or an idea or just being a good person in the world and a, having a great family. People born with Saturn in the fourth, you know, and, and I have all the, the, the traditional interpretations in my mind, don't worry, you know, about responsibility for family and so on. But, you know, I often find that families actually, I mean, it, it's statistically proven that you're better to have a family than not to, regardless, because then you have a framework, something you can push against and, you know, accept, reject, reform, discuss, you know, th there's something about finding s some treasure in that family. Now, this is heroic and, and it's mythic, so we're really talking here about, you know, a slaying the dragon, or rescuing the maiden, or descending into the underworld and, and becoming queen, uh, Persephone, um, of returning to the upper air as, as you know, the ruler, of the underworld, the one who nurtured and cared for and looked after the shades. And so there's something very heroic about having Saturn in the fourth. Everybody can pat yourself on the back if you've got it there. Because A, it's an angle, and it means that you have to really spend a life retrieving things from the roots. Uh, I have a client who you know, inherited some money and had to incredible desire to write a book um, about her origins and family, which meant going down into the deepest denizens of the deep, dark south of the United States of America and, you know, finding out about slavery and all sorts of exciting and amazing and shocking secrets, and which really made a great little novel that she wrote. And so that was her atonement. And, and then that's where her Saturday is. And so and that was their second hour return. All right, so we can see that the whole quadrant is about creative development. And so in order to have our development become creative, we do need to get to the root of issues in the family so that we can, you know, really see what we've got as our basic foundations. In the fifth house, when Saturn is transiting it, it's written here, refining the treasure. Well, that's a little vague. Um, but what it really is, as it's heading towards the, yes, it's heading towards the sixth house, is, is taking a look at what your value is. Like, what are you worth? Now, in keyword astrology, this house has to do with um, creativity. Now, the easiest thing to create is children. Now, they're not the easiest things to raise, of course, but it, you know, it's pretty much of a spontaneous act and doesn't require a lot of thought. You know, whereas, you know, if you want to you know, design an entire new computer program or write a book, you, you do have to put a little more effort into it than conceiving a baby. But what it is, is it's a conception period. So when Saturn's going through your fifth, you're undergoing a conception period wherein your treasure, which is the gift from the family, which sometimes is kind of interesting because if you came out of, say, an abusive family, you still have something to gain from that. There's still some kind of treasure in there. And you can take that treasure and move it. And when it moves, Saturn transits, if you're born with Saturn in the 
second, uh, fifth house, then you are required to spend a great deal of time really finding and digging very deeply into your own self as a persona. Uh, you know, how you can become, uh, you know, a, a very refined, honed, you know, shining aspect of your own self. Or literally, you know, become a creative artist. But we're all creative. I mean, I've often sort of not jokingly said, look, let's say you have the most horrible problem. You just can't bear the problem. It's just dreadful. And so the only way out, so you kill yourself. Well, that that's not very creative, is it? Um, I think it would be more creative to uh, do something about it. You know, go to therapy, anything. Anything that will give you the courage to take your interior gifts because the second house is you know what you have to invest the fifth house is your investment potentials um, you know it has you know to do with your children and art and it has to do with resources but resources that are you know essentially used for creative purposes and it's heading toward now midpoint to to the return to, to the struggle at the threshold of returning. And this struggle, I mean, it's like every hero struggles at the threshold of adventure. And, and it can be really banal, like, you know, struggling whether you should keep those old sheets or that favorite couch that's really actually rather awful when you're moving house, okay? So we're really looking at the next phase where Saturn, as it, uh, keep in mind, I'm talking on two levels here. I'm talking about natally, like thinking in terms, okay, I have Saturn natally here, therefore this. Or right now you might be having Saturn transiting your sixth house, so you can think that about the transit of it in your sixth house. But you see, once you have retrieved and gone into the roots of your very nature, and found the treasure, because even in the most horrendous family, there's always something that can be got from it. And then fleeing with it, that's it. Yeah? I mean, it may not be the grail, it may not be the saving the maiden, uh, you know, it may not be Persephone entering the end world, but it will bring you into the creative refining of your personal treasure, leading into work. Because the sixth house is known for what's well, called job, yeah, as versus career, okay, vocation, I should say. Tenth house, vocation, sixth house, this is what my body does in order to do my vocation or my career. But it's the embodiment of the treasure. So this whole angle is about creative development. This whole angular part of the, the horoscope, the second phase. And creative development is finding better ways to solve problems even. That's a very creative thing to do. Because sometimes, you know, we have a problem and it really is huge and it's, it, it, it's tragic even sometimes. But there is always a way of manipulating, if you will, because Saturn has to do with manipulating as well. Like, how can I manipulate my environment? How can I massage it, they say in business? Let's massage it. Have you got enough wiggle room? Yeah. And and so in the sixth house when Saturn, if you're born with it there, then you are really tied into the embodiment of the creative. You have to do something or your body will respond. And that doesn't necessarily respond in a good way. It can respond um, by uh, obstructing you periodically, um, the body. Because the body is where we have all our visceral memories from intrauterine, from conception on. So we know in our body what we're worth because we felt it. And so the body, if it's hurting or breaking down or has have needing an emergency surgery or something, 
it's it's very symbolic. I mean, it, you know, I might be a lunatic, but it's all symbolic as far as I'm concerned, even though it's real. I mean, you've got to pay the money for it and you know, you've got to deal with it and people have to come and look after you and it's all pretty much of a drag. But at the same time, it's part of your your honing because that's what Saturn is. Saturn is the is the uh, adamant sickle upon which we hone our precious jewels and all the difficult things because the Buddhists call difficult things and bad people precious jewels because they teach us something that we may not have bothered to know if we hadn't encouraged, encountered that situation. And the body, it doesn't house the soul, but it is in direct uh, opposition to it. Astrology is all about oppositions and, and the ultimate purpose of astrology is to is to is to the mysterium conjunctio that Jung talked about where we blend opposites into one. And and the, you know and the magnum oppositorum is the work of the opposite of working the opposite, which is what's so interesting about the horoscope and the way it moves because it actually moves in contra to what how it appears to be <laughs> anyway so we're here we are saturn in the sixth house you were born with it let's say and so your entire life is going to be bound up with trying to find treasures to bring back to the to humanity and we begin the final phase and in it and, and when you get your report, you would it would start and and actually there are, it's like 88 pages. I mean it's really intense. I just loved writing it because I got so inspired by the uh, elegance and the control and organizational function that working with an archetype like Saturn actually gave me. I mean I spent hours in the British Library reading room in the rotunda <clears throat> when I was in London, when it still existed and it doesn't, I mean, I was so lucky. I was in possibly, I was in heaven. <laughs> I mean, my kind of heaven. I have Mars, Saturn, Pluto in the ninth. So to me, heaven is, you know, <clears throat> standing in the, I would love to have been Christian Amanpour. You know, I just wish that I was on TV with the wind blowing my hair and the bombs going off behind me so I could tell people how it was going. Like, how was your day? <laughs> so when you get into this business of adventure and social integration, uh, be careful because you don't want to limit Saturn yourself uh, to only others. Saturn, and it also means if you were born with Saturn in your in your seventh house or eighth or ninth, that you are actually a call to adventure person. Do you get that? That that's part of what you have to do in this lifetime is to learn how to integrate socially. Saturn is not very social. In fact, Unless it's in control. Now that's not that's a good idea there, um, because if you can be in a situation in which you are absolutely and ultimately in control of absolutely everything, it would be perfect. Except that's not possible. <laughs> so it's not perfect. And so there you are, Saturn in the seventh discovery of others. What are you discovering? Are you discovering that you want to rule them or that they want to rule you? Uh, you want to go on an adventure and yet you seem bound to other people. There's a very interesting little dialectic going on there with Saturn in the seventh house. In the old book, Saturn is elevated or, uh, you know, in, in the sign of Libra. And, um, and the seventh house I, would also be the same. And so what this is is when, if it's in a transit, okay, you have to drag yourself above the horizon again, as if the struggle to descend wasn't enough and the struggle to retrieve your, your treasure, now you have to struggle to return to the world, to the world of reality. And, you know, if you were born with Saturn in the, this third quadrant, um, 
it's like the because the heroic journey is the call to adventure, okay, and it begins at the apex of the horoscope. And you have Saturn in the third quadrant, which means that eventually that's where you're going to have Saturn transit first. So your heroic journey only begins when Saturn crosses the first angle that it re, that it by transit that it will that it transits, for lack of a better term. Um, so if the, if you are a heroic call to adventure type. Um, your life does assume a pattern of challenge, even though even if it's in the eighth or the ninth, and it'll just be in a challenge, and and learning to manage uh, uh, and control things is very important to learn to work with others and deal with like unspoken and implied things that will help you create a strong sense of inner security for the Shakespearean, you know slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Someone in the, with Saturn in the 10th, uh, 11th, 7th house, if they're reasonably, you know, enlightened and aware, um, I think would make it a tremendous partner. And, uh, you know, tremendous partner because they're, they're, they're there to to do things um, as a kind of um, infi, an, an infant ability to bring all of the sum and total of this person's um, interior treasure into the world and to try and integrate it into society. Now, if we move it from the, I wonder why that's happening. It's interesting. Okay. So, social integration. Well, this is the opposite house, isn't it? The eighth of the second house. And it's in square aspect to the 5th and also to the 11th, keeping in mind that these are the fixed houses. Therefore, they are very likely to be difficult houses to change your yourself okay, in it. Now, if it's transiting through your 10th, then that means that you're in a position where you're going to undergo what I say here is rites of mystery, which is the deep and great understanding of the depths of human nature, what they're like, which means that you're going to learn so much about human nature that you might think, oh, that's not a very good idea. <laughs> However, it means that you can, if you were born with it here, by the time you're like, say, two and a half to three or four, that you will be full of adventure and you'll have already undergone this at a very early age. I hope I haven't lost or confused you with having done that, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to do the transit and also the natal position at the same time, but segregate them. So born with Saturn in undergoing rites of mystery means that you know you really have to look at everything that comes your way and that and to and that you really don't like being kept in the dark i mean people who have saturn the eighth are terrified when people when they know people are not people are not being honest or truthful they really it scares them because and that ever and for good reason um you know if somebody is not telling you the truth and they're keeping you in the dark or in the mystery you know they sort of say you know don't be a mushroom you know being kept in the dark and fed shit. So with Saturn in the eighth, you definitely don't want that. And that would be something that might come up as a test. It also, this whole description could also come up as a test as you're going through Saturn to the eighth. And it's also that because you are by nature of, to, of the house bound up with other people's resources, this is your personal resources, this is your resources, you know, in various kinds of ways, whether it's, you know, conception and gestation and delivery of creativity. Uh, this is also where you can join your resources one and all with another, okay, the, which, which has to do with, say, corporations or marriage. Yeah, so it, it can be that simple. And then the next stage of the entire call to adventure is when, well, 
if you were born, you know, with Saturn here, um, then it would begin again, yet again. Now remember, it will start again and again at each. But the civilization of Belize. Now that's really interesting because it's related to the assembling of tools. Now I mentioned in the assembling of tools, the most primitive uh, communication skills that you ever learn are in your childhood, infanthood, and in your in early schooling. Civilizations of beliefs comes at a, a, a time when you're a, what's called a sophomore, which interestingly, a sophomore, of course, being a first year university student, it, it, it's a Greek word that means uh, wise fool, sophron, moron, sophomore. So it means understanding more and more and being a mature person in the world, even if you're only like, let me see, two, four, six years old, you're still, you get very advanced in the way you're, you're assembling information that people give you, your family and parents and so on. And then, if you're born with it, in the ten, ninth house, that means that you are forever seeking the call to adventure. I'm going to leave it there for right now. Does and I'm going to. I see that I've somehow managed to leave a few minutes at the end here. Enid, do you want? Do you, do you have anybody have with any questions? We, we do have questions. Oh my goodness! I just opened it up. Oh my word! Spart on D Barbara Darnell. Thank you. That's all I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's perfect and I did it well. Okay. I believe I missed the. What is Karen Harmon saying? I think she was just commenting that she missed the third step in Saturn transiting an angle. That was at the beginning of your talk. So if, if um, Karen, if you have more. So, well, this one, the next one after that, what about Saturn on the Ascendant? If, you, if you're born with Saturn right on one of these angles or just before or just okay. after. Oh, well, thank you. Shall we talk about me? Um, <laughs> I was born with Saturn in the, like, uh, within a few degrees, okay, of the of the 10th house. Now, if I were born with Saturn, like, and this is a problem, this would be problematic with horoscopy. We don't really know if the time is correct. I don't care how how many clocks are looked at and how many doctors say and how, you know, because I know that I was born at 721, 24 a.m. And um, that was because it was logged by doctor, my father, and for uh, reasons of infant mortality, because all hospitals have to look at, have to mark the day, birth time in case the baby dies. And so it's hard to know, but I would say, okay, if you were born with Saturn in the 12th house and it was, Within, I mean, it has to be, if we want to be really, really, really specific, I would say if you had Saturn right on your ascendant, but just into the 12th house that you, you are, you know, the quest for identity person. And if I wanted to be really, really anal, I would say, and and the, and then if it was like say fifty minutes into the first house that you were actually an IC person you would you were seeking creative development. I think that with this you would want to make be creative, okay? Because you're all old enough. Oh, I'm seeing a full answer question here. So if natal Saturn is in the seventh house then the struggle angle will be in the call to adventure in the 10th house. Absolutely correct. And because the struggle is as you cross the threshold, right? And so that means you can be up to, well, 10 years old if you're born in the far north or, you know, et cetera. Or you can be, if it's exact, it's whenever it hits the midheaven, that's when, you know, that's your name. That's your, your quest. That's where you're, so if you have something in the 10th, your quest is toward self-development. Really important is, is really becoming who you are. You might know 
uh, by this. Um, you see, I, can't, I guess it's, it's Barbara is asking the question. What time, what does the degree have to do with the time your journey start? So that's, so basically you're answering that. So if you're, if you're, yeah. where your Saturn is, however many years it takes from that degree to cross the angle. Right, right, which brings in something really interesting, and that is that if this is true in the case, and from what I've seen, is that that means that you don't come into your own until it crosses the first angle in your chart. Right. So, yeah, so I was 18 months old when, when, when my father, we drove all the way across Canada, and I have done nothing but drive and, and fly and get and go all over the world. That's always been my quest, and to meet people, to form tribes, um, you know, astrology groups. Uh, basically, yes, you, I mean, you, you know you know that I've been involved since the beginning <laughs> of time, forming astrology groups that if we didn't, we wouldn't even exist if it weren't for my bunch, my people, right, all, all the people. So I was born driven to do this. But, so that was my whole content, was a call to adventure. To me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm not so interested. I've been enough places and I've been to the Middle East. And I've, that, I'm not that crazy, but it used to be that if somebody said a uh, plane ticket, I was on the plane. Okay, that actually, I guess that also makes the question about the third step. Because you said that when you do cross the angle, yeah. that there were four steps that occurred. Oh, right. The four steps are when, um, as soon as you cross the angle, you want to go through separation from the known path, and then a period of ego loss or identity, and then from that sacred transitional space emerge many images of what could be, and then finally a sorting period during which, from which those options, actual results can occur. And that would be after you struggle to cross and you hauled yourself across the ascendant or the icy and then you begin the four stages of development and those are random those are just up to you, up, up to your own psyche so they're not really oh you have two people born with saturn in their 10th house in capricorn what does that mean it means there's a really weird synchronicity between Lori and candace <laughs> um okay saturn in the 10th house in capricorn well it means that uh you take on quite a bit of responsibility and that, you know, you're just born like that and it's like sometimes it's not very pleasant to find yourself always the one who is going to be the responsible individual. But it also means that your first angle crossing is toward the quest for identity and self-development. And so that with the 10th Saturn, and in Capricorn, which is a kind of double whammy. Capricorn's Pisces, I guess you'd have Aries maybe on your ascendants, depending on how late it was. But it would be about, you know, being born already with the expectation that that was what you're meant to do, to really bring your aspirations to the fore, okay? And then when it goes through the second at a very early age, obviously, like three to four, and then four to seven or six, five to seven in the 12th house, um, you may have, have some pretty strong memories about your earliest relationships with other kids and about finding a tribe. And sometimes it means rejection uh, in order to find it and, and you know, bringing a great deal of strength about being able to form a group. Let's say there are no tribes that you can join because there's, they just aren't, they don't exist. You can make one at some point in your life, like 29 years later. Okay. Did that help? Well, that gives kind of an idea of how you, how you would actually do a direct interpretation. There are some very just practical questions here that... Yeah, those are the... I'm, that that's very important because... ...to get to. And one of them is so... Is this only going to work if you're thinking, I mean, you've drawn it out with houses all looking like they're equal, so would that well, you have work to. with an equal house system or any? No, no it works. It, or with any that's where I, I do urge you to get your own yeah. because it, 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 it's not about, this is a, a construct. This is not a reality. Um, 
the ascendant and midheaven are always at an angle with exact equal houses if you were born on the equator at noon. Right. That's the only time. It sometimes gets. So, yeah, so, so basically you're focused. So it's really personal. It's, yeah. Like there's no rules here. It's about. Um, how, how, yeah. Well, no, wait a minute. I'm just. No matter what here. house system, all these four, all these four angles are all are there. It doesn't matter what houses you're calling the in between. Well, quite ex exactly. Yeah. The intermediate houses are entirely up to you, and which ones you use. And in fact, it may be a measurement. Although this is a process, it's not an event. Right. But it can mark as an event. Okay. It can start with an event, but it will lead to something else. Um, and it's, uh, I'm just looking here at. So there's there's a number of individual ones. Let's pick. No, no, this chart is not in my book. The yeah. chart, this is all a, dis, a beautifully, elegantly designed and programmed with Kepler at its base and me writing it all, but the design and the whole thing of the here, here, personal heroic journey is actually gorgeous. So it's, it, it's not in the book. It's in the heroic journey though, on my, in my store. Whole sign puts Saturn into the first, but Placid puts it into the 12th. Um, well, that, that I don't know because you see whole sign is a very old system and I'm not really sure and I'm pretty much of a, a contemporary astrologer and I have no argument with any tones but I'm not really sure I I would look at it as if oh well I first of all we wouldn't be get sending it to you as whole sign <laughs> yeah. uh, solves the problem right there well, this this is one thing that I think astrologers do need to keep in mind is when you develop such an elegant system like this with a quadrant system, it's probably better to work with it with the quadrant system. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. You're right. You're absolutely although, right. Although there's still information you might be able to glean from whole sign because I use whole sign and work with quadrants but I find different information. So that's, it still becomes incredibly rich, I think, whichever ever system. And that's really nice to hear. I mean, that's, that's very sensible to me. I, I mean, that's where, um, you know, in order not to make yourself completely crazy over 50 years, is there is a point <laughs> at which you do settle down into one particular format. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was, my first real actual teacher was Dane Ridriar, and so I used um, Campanus for a while. But I, I never found it, you know, to work for me. I'm just really like Placidus Houses. So that's going to be what it would come in. Um, you are smart enough, you guys, when you get your heroic journey, is that you'll be able to tell when that happens. You'll realize, you'll start feeling it happen. So, as you say here, it's not about transiting Saturn, changing signs into a new whole sign house. It's more about, for example, Placidus house system. Only when transiting Saturn goes over the angles. Yeah. It's, well, it's, no, the yeah. angles are, you know what? The only real thing in astrology on the horoscope are the angles. Everything else is a mathematical hallucination. <laughs> One of the most succinct descriptions of house systems and how is in the beginning of Howard Sisportis' book called The Houses. And it's absolutely beautiful because it's so three pages long, it explains everything. So I have no problem with people using various kinds of houses. But you would you you know, the idea is that there is this is a, a you know, a very significant theme and whole signs yeah I'm not I have no argument yeah if you didn't have a timed birth could you use the Sun on the ascendant like like one can do for reading the chart to try and look at this yeah I I I, I we I went through that we went and my my wonderful Rebecca Martin who did all the programming with Kepler at its base and I all the she did the beautiful designs all these designs and they're all throughout the book um, I thought a lot about that, and I felt I felt sorry. But if you don't know your birth time, I don't think I would apply. I would buy it. 
you can't use a solar chart. There's no way we can actually, well, you'd have to, like, first of all, what you would have to do, because when you go to the store, you have to enter your birth date, okay? So you would have to yourself get the birth data as to when the sun was right on your, so, like your solar chart, and tell that, say what time it was, and then we could, could try it. But I I don't think so. It, it would be I mean it is from your your son's perspective, but this is really from your entry into the world. Yeah, perspective. yeah. This is all about embodiment of the self. Yeah. And, and your psychological background. So that say say I mean I just went around once. What if you go around twice? You know to 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 fifty eight, and then let's say you hit ninety. Okay. So what we. And there is a, a third time around. There's a first time, the second time, and the third time around. Well, what you're doing is you, you will see by looking back, and I've, I've made notes all through my very first rough copy of this, this development of this program, was, was I, I was astounded at the stuff that had happened to me at that time. I mean, I just couldn't believe that it was so dead on because it was, it was literal. And so... And it was very Saturnian because it was formative. And so when you start looking into formative things, this kind of, 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 a, of, a, of a, a, a you know, book, booklet, is, would be ideal for someone who is like, you know, doing self-therapy or self-development work um, because that way you can look at what you're building on six years ago, seven years ago. You can look back and forth and... I mean, there's even a, we have a little journal thing in the back to write what was happening when it first went over your ascendant, or you know, and some of the things that I've I've seen have actually shocked me, you know, because even though I wrote it, I was shocked and I went, oh my god, so that's what I was doing, you know, yeah, and uh, that's why I'm here to learn. Well, it's now I see somebody asking here, core about the five degree rule. Uh, well. Rules are made to be broken, I think. <laughs> so if you are 4.5 degrees within an any angle, is it conjunct that angle? Uh, no, it would be in the 12th house, okay? So if, for example, five degrees before the ascendant, oh, I anticipate that, is your quest then only when transiting Saturn crosses the IC? No, it would be crossing your ascendant. Okay. So there's there's a good question though um, that's also up here on retrograde. If you're born and then the uh, planet retrogrades, uh, um, oh, it's written goes, in. The programming is bloody brilliant. Uh, okay. Part of my language. It's written. It happens once and then it happens another time. Yeah. And it's up there, written in the on the page. I wish I could uh, I could show you, you know, but I can't. Okay. Um, but it's written on the page because up in the top of each of each report, because I didn't actually do copies of it, but each page. But the thing is that at each page it gives you the exact moment when it does that. Across. Saturn goes over the angle and all through the first house, and then it talks about. And so it goes about. Ta it'll give you like two pages on Saturn crossing the ascendant, and then Saturn in the first house, Saturn in the second house, and it gives you the day and time. It's fantastic. So, so one of the things, I mean, in, in terms of this is development, it seems also like some of the other questions here are, well, what if you haven't handled it very well? It would seem like as it handled goes, what? Handled, handled the transformations and the transitions that goes across the angle. It seems like, would, do you see in a life that it's like the second time around that it comes, you, you've, or... Yeah, or any division of Saturn transits by quadrating. Okay. In other words, um, yes, I, I think that we are sometimes do. Uh, I mean, I when my Saturn return occurred and then went over in my 10th house, I made a really big mistake. And, you know, I have to live down. Mm -hmm. And it was an important wake-up call. Yes. And I was 60... 59. Sometimes those Saturn transits, they're not very pleasant, but boy, can they be helpful for us to learn a lesson. That's what I understand from all the many, many people I speak to, you know, that, you know, there's, there's no such thing. Well, that's not true. 
there are things that are absolutely and utterly unacceptable, okay, going on everywhere in the world right as we speak. <clears throat> However, within those of us who are here talking and those of us who are involved in astrology, it's very unlikely that you're committing any great, great crimes. But the worst crime, of course, is to remain unconscious. And if you are conscious that you think that you did not deal in the way which you would have really like to have dealt with a very significant timing or transit, and I were talking to you, I would actually question you if you were if you were if that was true. You know, maybe it's the way you're looking at it. Maybe it was you know something that you really needed, yeah, to to know, mm -hmm. and that. And it may have taken that very experience to, you know, because like, in the reading of the material on the, it gives a whole different way of looking at good, bad, and 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 the ugly, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's a whole other way of looking at it, and so it helps, you know. Well, I, you know, we, we always like to think we're also always growing better and better with age as we're we're doing things and we're going to learn better. But well, it isn't it, always the case, is it? It isn't always the case. No, it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes we we're reduced into our children going, "Oh God, Mom, not again!" <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my God, I'm sorry." Well, that, don't be sorry. Just do it. I'm going, oh God. <laughs> yeah, you know, but that that we have a joke in my family, and it's the "Oh God" moment, right? <laughs> oh God, Mom. And so, you know, somebody's going to point it out. You know, you don't want to point it out to yourself. Then somebody else will. And, you know, people can be quite mean. And we can be really mean to ourselves. And so I think sometimes people are very hard on themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why Saturn is also considered to, to be one of the challenging planets is because it doesn't that's let us... That's what it's all about. Yeah, it doesn't let us escape from from dealing with ourselves and our, the, as you say, this embodiment. And this is a, a rather, this is a very elegant system.